Hello friends, my name is Anuva Parasa and we are going through the uh, lecture of engineering mechanics and this is the first lecture and we will cover up basics of vectors in this lecture. Okay, so my name is Anuva Parasa and I am a B.Tech in mechanical engineering from NIT Jalanda. I have cleared UPSC two times and I have secured all India rank a uh, good rank in gate 70 out of 100 marks and i have three years of teaching experience okay so let us first see what exactly is engineering mechanics and what are the different topics we will study here so engineering mechanics if i say um, what exactly is mechanics mechanics i can say it is study of forces and its effect study of forces and its effect so here we'll see what are the different forces that can act on a body and uh, what is the effect of those forces like if a force x there will be acceleration there will be angular acceleration linear acceleration velocity will change a lot many things can have happen right so these are the things we are going to study so what are the different kinds of force that can act on a body and what are the different effects that can be produced on the body with the use of this forces okay now mechanics can be divided into two parts statics and dynamics if i'm saying statics statics means where the body the system under study is not moving means velocity is equal to zero the velocity is zero okay and if the body starts moving we move on to dynamics here velocity is not equal to zero okay and dynamics again can be classified into two parts kinematics and kinetics if i talk about kinematic kinematics here we study the motion definitely if velocity is not zero if velocity is not zero means the body is in motion here in kinematics we study the motion but we don't consider the reason behind the motion what is the reason behind the motion force we don't consider the force and in kinetics we consider the motion we study the motion along with the force that is the why is this motion happening in kinematics we will take out using the equations of uh, motion equations of motion like v is equal to u plus a t v is equal to u plus a t we will try to find out what is the acceleration but we are not bothered uh, why is this acceleration caused in kinetics we will try to take out the force that is actually causing the acceleration we know force is equal to mass into acceleration so the acceleration that is found out here it will be used in this equation to find out the force that is causing the acceleration okay i hope you got it so what are the different chapters in statics and dynamics in statics the first chapter is vectors we will see vectors then in the second lecture we will see newton's first law third law and equilibrium the, this is going to be your second lecture and third lecture we will see truss okay so i have classified statics into three parts okay and then we will come into dynamic dynamics though the first chapter of dynamics should be kinematics but i am not going to cover kinematics in much detail because it is an easy chapter and most of the students they are much affluent with kinematics okay but it is not so that i will not discuss the principles of kinematics whatever concepts are there in kinematics instead of considering it as a different chapter i will include these concepts in different chapters like newton's laws of motion friction circular motion okay so we will solve many problems there okay we will solve the problems of kinematics in this chapters plus one more reason of not considering kinematics is because it is not directly asked in gates exam but the concepts of kinematics are required here okay so that is the way i will cover it i'll cover up i'll also do some problems but it will be covered somewhere here okay so our fourth lecture will be of uh, newton's second law of motion then fifth lecture friction then i'll cover up circular motion walk power energy collision 
and conservation of momentum and lastly rotational motion so if you see with respect to gait with respect to gait this chapter newton's second law of motion and friction newton's second law of motion friction and rotational motion these are very very important chapters with respect to gait and these are the most important and most conceptual chapters okay so we will be covering all these chapters in much detail okay let us get started the first chapter that is vector algebra so this is a very simple chapter i'll say one thing that questions are not asked from vectors directly in gate exam however you will find the application of vectors in many areas uh, in many subjects including engineering mechanics engineering mechanics will be full of vectors okay force velocity acceleration lot many things torque okay all these are vector quantities we'll be using it throughout engineering mechanics plus you'll also be using uh, vectors in many other subjects such as strength of materials you'll use them in uh, um, theory of machines okay fluid mechanics lot lot many places so this is a very very important chapter so we'll be covering we'll not go into much hard problems in vectors but instead we will be considering the concepts in vectors the basic concepts in vectors which will help you which will actually help you to uh, grasp to do all different types of problems which has which requires the application of vectors okay so and also uh, you go through this chapter of vectors in uh, engineering maths so i'm i'm not teaching with that point of view i'll be teaching you vector algebra with the point of view of physics the way it is required in mechanics and subjects uh, other subjects of engineering okay okay let us get started all the quantities can be classified into three parts scalars vectors and tensors what are scalars scalars are those quantities which requires only magnitude to define them example is mass temperature if you consider the example of temperature just by providing the numerical magnitude 15 degree centigrade is enough you don't need to specify anything else it is a complete definition of temp temperature right similar is a condition with speed pressure so these quantities which requires only magnitude are known as scalars but there are certain quantities which requires magnitude as well as direction to define them such quantities are known as vectors examples of such quantity are force velocity acceleration let us consider the example of force just by giving the magnitude that is let me say 15 newton is not enough magnitude of force just by giving the magnitude of force 15 newton is not enough along with the magnitude you will also have to specify along with the magnitude you will also have to specify the direction of force is it a pull force is it a push force is it acting from the top is it acting from the bottom that you have to specify only then the definition of force is complete so such quantities which requires both magnitude and directions are known as vectors and here comes the third category of quantities this most of you might not be knowing this is known as the third category is known as tensors okay it requires one magnitude and two directions yes it requires two directions to completely define them example of such a quantity is stress well i'll not go into much detail of stress tensors because it will not be used in physics or engineering mechanics i left it for the subject of i leave it for the subject of strength of materials stress will be discussed in strength of materials you will get to see okay okay now representation of vector how is a vector represented so vectors can be represented there are two ways of representing a vector okay so this is the first way of representing a vector that is by an arrow a vector is represented by an arrow the length of the arrow represents the magnitude of the vector and the direction of the arrow and the direction of the arrow represents the direction of the vector so direction how you are going to specify the direction you are going to specify the direction by giving certain angle let me say this vector makes an angle alpha with the x axis so this is how you are going to specify 
okay so if you want to represent a vector as you can say this is vector a so how you're going to write vector a you will simply write a and draw an arrow on the top of it this right this represents vector a okay unit vector what is a unit vector as the name suggests this is a vector of unit magnitude this is a vector of unit magnitude okay first to have a unit vector you must have a parent vector to have a unit vector first you must have a parent vector let me say this is a parent vector parent vector okay so this need not be of unit magnitude it can be of any magnitude okay generally greater than one now you want to find out a unit vector in the direction of parent vector unit vector in the direction of parent vector okay so it is found out by the parent vector it is found out by parent vector divided by the magnitude of parent vector this is known as mod of a this is known as mod of a what is mod this represents the magnitude of vector a this represents the magnitude of vector a so uh, we represent a unit vector by a cap we, this is a and we draw a cap on the top of it this is unit vector so unit vector is nothing else but vector a divided by the magnitude of a okay now unit vector in x direction is given by i cap unit vector in y direction is given by j cap unit vector in z direction is given by k cap so if you're taking x direction see x direction is an infinitely x axis if i am saying x axis is an infinitely long line line right so if i want to give a unit vector unit vector is a vector of unit magnitude in the direction of x axis is known as i cap similarly y axis will also be infinitely long line right so what is unit vector unit vector is a vector of unit magnitude in y direction this is known as j cap and similarly unit vector in z direction is known as k cap okay so this is very important to remember this this three points are very important to remember unit vector in x direction is given by i cap unit vector in y direction is given by j cap and unit vector in z direction is given by k cap now as i said there is another method of representing a vector here it is let us see how to how to how to uh, define a vector this way so first one first i've given the magnitude and uh, is represented by an arrow so let me say this is the second method let me say this is a vector a okay this is a vector a it is in three dimensional point so if you want to move from the tail of the vector to the head head of the vector how you have to travel let me say you have to travel x units in x direction x i cap y units in y direction is plus y j cap and then you have to travel z units in z direction z k cap okay so vector a is defined as by amount you have to from to reach from the tail of the vector to reach of the vector how many units you have to cover in x direction how many units you have to cover in y direction and how many units you have to cover in z direction this is how it is represented okay and how to find out the magnitude in the previous case in the previous case the length of the vector in the previous case the length of the vector was representing the uh, magnitude okay so how you are going to find out the magnitude here as you know magnitude of a is given by root over x square plus y square plus z square the magnitude of a is given by root over x square plus y square plus z square okay so you'll be using it let us do a question here you are given with a vector a is equal to 3 i cap plus 5 j cap plus 4 k cap you require to find out the unit vector so we know what is unit vector unit vector is given by vector a divided by magnitude of a vector a divided by magnitude of a isn't it so what is vector a magnitude of a it is 3 square plus 5 square plus 4 square isn't it okay this comes out to be 5 root 2 right now unit vector is vector a divided by the magnitude of a okay so what is the magnitude of a 
have substituted the value here hmm? so it comes out to be this much okay so simple calculation now most of you might be thinking how come this is a unit vector it doesn't doesn't look like an unit vector from any angle it is why because unit vector has a magnitude of one has a one unit magnitude right but this vector doesn't look like it has a one magnitude but it does have so please find out the magnitude how using this formula magnitude of unit vector so if you want to find out the magnitude of unit vector what you are going to do take mod that is root over x square plus y square plus z square please do this you will find out that the magnitude is equal to 1 magnitude of this vector is, magnitude of this vector is equal to 1 okay now multiplication of a vector by a number a scalar quantity okay a number it can be any number it could be 2 it could be 3 it could be 4 it could be 10 it could be 15 it could be minus 2 it could be minus 5 it could be minus 6 whatever okay so let us see what happens suppose we have a vector a suppose we have a vector a and we multiply it by any scalar quantity k so we get a new vector we get a new vector with magnitude k times a okay now the direction of this new vector k times a is decided by the scalar quantity if the scalar quantity is positive the new vector will have direction same as that of a and if this k is a negative quantity then the direction of k dot a is opposite to the vector a what does it mean suppose i have this vector suppose i have this vector okay of whatever magnitude let me say a and i multiply this vector by number k is equal to 3 so what will happen you will have a new vector which is equal to 3 times a so k is a positive quantity that's why the direction of this vector is same both the vectors 3 into a and a is same now suppose this vector is the k k k is equal to minus 2 so what will happen if k is equal to minus 2 the new vector you will get is 2 times a and its direction will be actually reversed okay so let us take another example if i if there is a vector e as you can see this there is a vector e you multiply it with minus and what will happen the magnitude will remain same only the direction will get reversed because you're multiplying e with one the magnitude will remain same right and what will happen to the direction the direction will get reversed so if this vector is e this vector is representing minus e okay okay the triangle law of vector addition this is a very important concept many students are confused here why we want to use triangle law why should we use triangle law what is the need of triangle law see i'll give you a very basic explanation which should clear your concept now see you have a vector let me say let me say this is a vector of magnitude five units and there is another vector of magnitude let me say two units now if these two vectors are collinear what is the meaning of collinear they must be in the same line if the, these vectors are collinear if you are adding these two vectors if you are adding these two vectors you will get a vector which is equal to 7 there is no problem in it and if the okay if the vectors are opposite to each other if you add the vectors you will get a vector which is magnitude is equal to 3 in this direction there is no problem in this okay if they are collinear but the problem arises when vectors are not collinear the problem arises when the vectors are not collinear if the vectors are not collinear if 5 and 2 the vectors you have seen here if they are not collinear it means a 5 is somewhere in this direction and 2 is somewhere in this direction 
then it is not possible my dear then it is not possible to add these two vectors and come up with the resultant of 7 so if the vectors are non collinear you have to use triangle law there are actually two laws which we will use one is a triangle law of vector addition and the next one is the parallelogram law of vector addition okay so the triangle law of vector addition it says if two sides of a triangle represent two vectors in the same order that a third closing side of the triangle taken in opposite order represents the resultant so here you can see a triangle you can see a triangle here okay if two sides of a triangle represents two vectors in the same order same order means head of the second ve vector the so tail of the second vector should lie at the head of the first vector okay so if two vectors represents two sides two sides of a triangle in the same order then the third closing side which is the third closing side this is the third closing side then a third closing side in the opposite order you can see this is in opposite order both the heads are coinciding yes the third side in the opposite order represents the resultant okay so what exactly is resultant what is the meaning of resultant you might be some some people might be confused with the meaning of resultant resultant means there are two vectors a and b so resultant of a and b means a single vector which will produce the same effect as that of a and b suppose in a body two forces vector a and force a and force b are acting now if you want to remove these two forces and apply one force that force is the resultant of a and b that is combination of a and b so what is resultant resultant is nothing else but a plus b and the formula for resultant is given by root over a square plus magnitude of magnitude of a square plus magnitude of b square plus 2 into this magnitude of a into magnitude of b cos theta where theta is the angle between the vectors theta is the angle between the vectors now this resultant is also a vector quantity so along with the magnitude you'll also have to provide the direction so how we are going to provide the direction we are going we are providing the direction as angle alpha it makes with vector a so what is tan alpha tan alpha is given by b sin theta divided by a plus b cos theta please remember b you are using here is the magnitude of b a you are using here is magnitude of a b you are using here is magnitude of b so using this formula you can find out the angle that the resultant makes with vector a we'll see this in more detail with a problem okay the next is the parallelogram law of vector addition see this two are actually the same same law it is uh, two sides of the same coin is used representing the same law there is nothing much different different okay so if you from b if you move it from here to here you get the parallelogram uh, triangle law isn't it now I, I i'll please i'll explain you one thing why addition why addition of vectors you can always shift the vectors parallelly this b vector is here so for my convenience what i can do i can shift this v vector from here i can to i can shift it to here no problem in this case i'll just cut this v vector sorry in that case i'll just cut this v vector okay so you see there's nothing else but a triangle law okay so when we will use the triangle law and when you are going to use the uh, parallelogram law we are going to use the parallelogram law or triangle law as per our convenience so what does parallelogram law say it says if two adjacent sides of a parallelogram represents two vectors with their tail coinciding you can see this is there are two vectors this is vector a and this is vector b the two vectors with their tail coinciding you can see the tails are coinciding right this represents two sides of a parallelogram this is the parallelogram and vector a and vector b represents two sides of a parallelogram so with their tail coinciding then diagonal of the parallelogram passing through the coinciding point is the coinciding point right diagonal of the parallelogram passing through the coinciding point represents the diagonal of the uh, represents the resultant you remember this way no problem you remember the triangle law parallelogram law both will be used as per our convenience if you see the formula both the formulas are same resultant is root over a square plus b square plus 2ab cos theta and tan alpha that is the angle it makes angle the resultant makes with vector a is b sin theta divided by a plus b cos theta okay let us solve an example 
So you are given two vectors of equal magnitudes with an angle theta. Use it anyway. You draw the triangle law or the parallelogram law. It's your wish. But my dear, I'll give you an concept here. Always consider the angle theta when you are using the parallelogram law. If you are uh, trying to find out the angle theta using triangle law, you might many times people get confused. Okay, so always try to find out uh, angle theta using parallelogram law. It is easier because you just need to you just need to place the vectors with their tail coinciding, and you just need to me measure the small length, right? So these are the vectors. Okay. Uh, with the angle theta so we need to find out the magnitude what is the magnitude resultant magnitude of the resultant root over a square plus b square now here it is given that both vector a and b are equal okay so it becomes a square plus a square plus 2 a, a cos theta if you calculate it the resultant comes out to be if you calculate it, the resultant comes out to be r 2a cos theta by 2 now this is not enough You'll also have to give the direction. Okay, this is not enough. You'll also have to give the direction. Okay, so how to give the direction now? Okay, using this formula. Now A and B both are same, right? A and B both are same. So what I'm doing, I'm putting A in place in everywhere in the formula. So we can simplify it. See so this mathematics, trigonometry, I'm not going much into detail. You must be knowing. Okay, sine theta can be written as two sine theta by two cos theta by two. 1 plus cos theta can be written as 2 cos square theta by 2. So can, things will cancel out. So 10 alpha is equal to 10 theta by 2 or I can say alpha is nothing else but theta by 2. So what does it mean? It means that if these are two vectors A, sorry. If these are two vectors, this is vector A and this is vector another A. This is vector A, this is vector another A. Okay. And uh, the magnitude is A sorry both the vectors will be different okay vectors will be different only the magnitude the same and this is the angle theta okay so the resultant is something like this and this angle alpha is equal to nothing else but theta by 2 alpha is nothing else but theta by 2 okay now here comes the next law that is polygon law of vector addition so you'll be using triangle law or parallelogram law when there are only two vectors okay you need the addition of two vectors if there are more than two vectors you'll use polygon law so what does polygon law says if n minus one sides of a n sided polygon represents n minus one vectors in a in same order then the n at or the closing sides represents the resultant taken in opposite order so if you have a polygon Okay, if you have a polygon, as you can see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, this is a 7 sided polygon. Okay, so n minus 1 means 6, 6 sides of this 7 sided polygon represents 6 vectors in the same order. You can see these vectors are f1, f2, f3, f4, f5, f6. And where did, you, where, where, where did we get these vectors from? We got these vectors from here. Let us see. This is a block. Let me say there are six forces acting on this block. Let me say there are six forces acting on this block. F1, F2, F3, F4, F5, and F6. You can see the directions are given. Now for addition, as I've already said, that the vectors can be shifted parallelly. For addition, the vectors can be shifted parallelly. So what I'm doing here is, I'm shifting F1 from here to here. You can see, I shifted it parallelly. So F2 from here to here, you can see I'm shifting it parallelly. Right. Similarly, I'm shifting F3, F4, F5, and F6 to form six sides of this seven-sided, that is heptagon, right? Of the seven-sided polygon. So the last side taken in opposite order. What do you say? Polygon law says, polygon law says that the last side taken in opposite order. The closing side taken in opposite order represents the resultant. So what is basically resultant here? Resultant is nothing else but the summation of all the forces. So if you remove all the forces from F1 to F6 and instead of the forces, you place the resultant R, the body will have same kind of effect. The body will have same kind of effect.
Now it is a very important note to make when the forces are represented by the size of a polygon. When the forces represent are represented by size of a polygon, if the polygon gets closed, then the resultant of the force is zero. For example, you have three forces. Let me say the forces. It makes a closed triangle. It makes a triangle. It's a closed polygon. In this case, my dear. In this case, my dear. The forces. In this case, my dear. The forces add up to be zero. In this case, my dear. The forces add up to be zero. Why? Because there is no room for resultant. There is no place for resultant. Suppose in this polygon, suppose F six was not like this, and this F six was something like this. Then where is the room for resultant? Resultant is zero because there is no space for resultant, right? Resultant is nothing else but zero. So always remember, if the force polygon is a closed polygon, then summation of force equal to zero. So this is a very important concept which is used in many places. Okay, so you have to, you might have to, you you will have 